Manuel. Isn't that interesting? That's like a little freebie. Okay, so here's the link to the song. Hi, I welcome and somebody else.
I thought it was a pretty version. The orchestra of the strings were particularly pretty. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we do rejoice because you are Emmanuel. You came. You came and, and, you, and you, you offer eternal life. You offer peace. You offer hope. You are our hope. Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that we are your sons and daughters and that we lack no good thing because you are Emmanuel, God with us in the good times and the hard times. So as we gather together to um, ponder some of the names of Jesus, um, I ask that you would be with us to touch us, to heal us, and to restore us in the area of our greatest need. And yes, Lord, to convict us where we need conviction. In your name we pray. Amen. I am... Um, most of you know, I'm a widow, and I have a lot of friends who are widows. We weren't widows when we met, but now we are. And so for, and we're older, you know, so for older people, and particularly widows, or widowers, if the men, it, it, it can be very difficult at holiday time, at seasons, because the families are dispersed. People we spent, our parents are usually gone. Uh, people we spent 40, 50 years with are gone. And friends are gone. And so it, it's, it can be a difficult season. And yet, if we choose to focus on the season of Advent or the season of Christmas or focus on the Lord Jesus, then suddenly all of that is gone. And we are alive, and we rejoice, and we find peace and serenity. So I have turned my focus once again to the Lord Jesus. And um, I want to spend the next four weeks, the four Mondays, thinking about Christmas. The fact that Jesus came that very first one, but also that he has promised he has coming back. But especially for myself and for each of you, I want to help us spend time this month focusing on the true meaning of Christmas. And in case you wonder, it's not about Santa Claus. It's not about the elves. It's not even about the Christmas trees. It is about our personal living relationship with the one who knew us before the foundation of the world. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you to a prophet to the nations. Now that is God speaking specifically to Jeremiah. But if God was able to know Jeremiah and formed him in the womb, does he not know each of us intimately? And did he not form each of us with plans and for a purpose? Psalm 139, 16 says, Oh, hi, 58. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. In Psalm 139, verse 13, says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb.
And Ephesians 1, 11 and 12 says, In him, in God, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. So the specifics are different. He was talking about Jeremiah, but the principle, I believe, is universal. I don't believe that anybody in here or anybody we know or even anybody, even the worst criminal that we ever met was created by randomness. I believe that every single person was created by God with hope and for a future and with plans. For many Christians... For many Christians, Christmas can be difficult. We might be missing loved ones, either through death, divorce, estrangement. Some of you may have estranged children or family members, or just simple geographical distance. We may be in need physically for healing of some sort or another, or we might be in need of provision. We might not have enough of the things we need. And since we all live in the same broken world, we for sure know the need for healing. Jesus is Jehovah Rapha, our healer. He is also the one who restores. But even better, even better to me, Jesus came as Emmanuel, God with us. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and beyond. God with us. Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we have shared before, I, I come to this every year because I just love, did you know that in, if people follow a liturgical church calendar, this is the um, beginning of the calendar, it's like the new year? As we have shared before, some churches celebrate Advent. Advent simply means coming. The first week, we will focus on hope. We know who hope is. We know what hope is and that hope is real and alive. We know that, right? But do we live like we have hope? Or do we get scared? Well, we all get scared. But when fear arises, what do we do with it? What do we do about it? Do we discuss the fear? Do we talk about it? Do we make the fear our best friend and daily companion? Or do we turn to the one who is hope? Mr. 58's mic is open. All right. I'm sorry. I'll fix it. You I'm just okay. having trouble here. Can you hear? You can hear it now, obviously. <laughs> I'm on my cell phone. Oh, okay. I am reading an Advent devotional called Unwrapping the Names of Jesus, and I'd never seen this particular one before, so I'm using that as a jumping off point. And the first name in there is the first name, is the best name, Yeshua or Jesus. Isaiah 9 2 says, it's a beautiful passage. You're going to love it. If you don't remember it, you remember it, but if you didn't know what it is, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness a light has dawned and then isaiah 6 and 7 says you'll know this from the messiah for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Do you remember we talked about that God is a jealous God a few weeks ago? 
zeal, jealous. And did you know, I did not, re I knew it, but I didn't know it. Jesus' name, the name Jesus, is the same root name as the name Joshua. And then you remember, Joshua in the battle of Jericho. Jericho, remember that? And the walls came tumbling down. In that battle, God gave Joshua a huge military victory. But Jesus, a different kind of Joshua, Jesus came as a different kind of warrior. He came and he battled and he won. And he won the victory over sin and death. He came to deliver all who called on him, not as the secular hero they thought they needed, not what they thought they needed, but as the savior of the world. Maybe, like the people of that time, we want Jesus to give us what we think we need, or even maybe what we actually need. Healing, finances, relationships, whatever our personal overriding need is. But what if? What if God has a better plan than we can imagine? What if every single moment, every single day, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us? Because you know what? He is. And so my question for us is, how does... Knowing Jesus as Emmanuel give us hope, personally or corporately. If anybody wants to say, you can. I'm waiting because I see two people. We know he's in control of everything. Okay, he is. That's the sovereignty of God. But remember, Emmanuel is God with us. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to let Mario type, and I'll tell you, for me, it means that no matter what I go through, the whole time my husband was sick and I was a caregiver, and then when he was dying and when my brother was dying and I was helping my sister-in-law and helping my brother, you know, you can actually help someone die <laughs> by praying for them and just simply being with them and listening to them. But the whole time that I was doing that, I had this little phrase, and it, it, it's really like, it, it, it's, it's my life phrase right now. It's, I am is Emmanuel. And that means to me that God, who is, like Don said, sovereign, he's also Emmanuel. He is with me every moment of every day. And he's with you no matter what you're going through, no matter what you have been through, no matter what you will go through in the future. God came as Emmanuel, God with us. And he's still with us. And he's still loving us. And he forever will. And in John 8, verse 12, oh, Maria said, I want to see and experience it more than, and more that Jesus Emmanuel, meaning God with us, I don't need to fear certain things. And if he is with us and for us, who or what can stand against him? No worries, we are safe in him. Sometimes, Mario, I have to tell, it, tell myself right smack out loud, God is I am and Emmanuel. And sometimes, like last week, I had to go do something scary, and I was all by myself for hours. <laughs> and, uh, well, not hours, but an hour and a half or so. And the whole time, I was having a little dialogue with Jesus as Emmanuel. Where are you? Oh, you know, where can I imagine that you are in relation to me right now physically? And you know what? It helped. You might think I'm crazy. John 8, 12 says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. 
Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Dodie note. Never walk in darkness? What is that as a double meaning? Ephesians 5.11 says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So we don't take parts in deeds of darkness. And I want to read, um, I want to read something from Romans about what God will do, Jesus does. And I want to read it in Amplified too. In uh, ESV it says, And in this way all Israel will be saved as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Banish ungodliness. And uh, Amplified says, So, at that time, the time of Yeshua, all Israel, that is all Jews who have a personal faith in Jesus as Messiah, will be saved. Just as it is written in Scripture, the Deliverer, Messiah, Jesus will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And isn't it great that he included us in there? And a pondering is remove, banish. How? Is this one of those already not yet things? A place where we are called to walk out our salvation with fear and trembling? He banished darkness. We are to have no part in deeds of darkness. Philippians says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And I love the um, already not yet. We are saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. And some theologian could explain that way better than me, but I totally understand it, and I did not pull the verses for it. So the first day of this devotional was Jesus as Emmanuel. The next name of Jesus, and I love this, the second day I pondered resurrection and life. Well, that's And it flatly says that in John eleven twenty five, very clear. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. Is, are my, on my computer, my words are going in slowly. Are they doing that on yours? Or is it just my computer? I was getting my phone out to ask you if it's working on your end. Maybe I need to go closer to my router. can do that. Okay, it's just it's just mine then. Okay, well that's great. All right, then it just looks funny here. Let's see what Coram Deo put it's tiny on mine. Past. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. We have been justified. Present. We are being saved from the power of 
and we are being sanctified. That's not that fun sometimes. And future, we will be saved from the presence of sin because we will be glorified. Thank you, Coram Deo. So John eleven twenty five says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. You know what? Every single person on earth is going to die one day. We can be scared to death of dying, <laughs> or we can remember that death, meaning the end of our time in this body on earth, is not the end, is it? And Jesus has literally, because he came that first time as that little baby, and Jesus has literally entered death and arose. He defeated hell and death, and he made a way for us to live forever with him. Now, does that give you hope? Remember, the topic is hope. 1 Corinthians says, 1554 says, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I'm going to tell you a little story. When we literally die, Hosea, you want it? Is that quoting Hosea, right? When we literally die, Jesus comes and moves us from temporal life to eternal life. Literally. I have been, uh, cool, I have been with several people as they died. They were believers. And for them, that transition from life on earth to their, today you will be with me in paradise kind of thing was so peaceful and so serene. My little brother near the end kept seeing Jesus and talking to him. And to my brother, he was ever so real. It was like he could see him there at the end of the bed. And he was talking to him. And my brother could not fathom that we were not seeing Jesus too. So we didn't argue with him. <laughs> we just said, oh, that's so cool. An author of the devotional I'm reading posed this question. She said, what does knowing that Jesus defeated death and knowing our eternal outcome, what, what does it do to our relationships? What effect does it have? What effect would it have on our work, our pastimes? And would it change how we live in the right now? And does it for you? And I want to read a prayer that um, I don't normally read prayers that other people wrote, but this particular prayer is really neat. So I'm going to read it for us. Lord, you are the resurrection and life. Our world is still torn by sin and destruction, but we acknowledge your will over it. And we look forward to the day when there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more grieving. And in the meantime, Help each one of us to live out the resurrection of your son. May we be an aroma of life to the dying, decaying world so that they too may enter eternal life with you. Hi, Mickey. And uh, we're talking about Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Some other verses are Psalm 139, 12, which says, Even the darkness. It's not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. And um, I want to ponder this for a minute. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden. If you think something's hidden from God, um, I got news for you. Nothing is hidden. Jesus sees all. He sees every thought. He sees our hidden actions. He sees the nice ones and the naughty ones. He loves us. He forgives us. But does the fact, does that fact negate that we have a part to play? Do we maybe 
sometimes need to invite the Lord to show us any areas of our life or our mind, our thought life, where we need resurrection in life? Are there things that Jesus needs to resurrect and bring to life? And conversely, could there be things that we need Jesus' help to put to death? And I think there's several scriptures about that, but as I was thinking uh, to myself out loud with my fingers on my typewriter, one is found in Romans 8.13. And it tells us, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. That's the part, the flesh must be put to death. That's the sanctification that Quorum Deo put in the present sanctification process. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And you know, Jesus did, while he was on earth, he actually did resurrect some people as in heal them from the dead. And we're going to look at a couple of those. Luke 7, 12 through 16 says, As he, Jesus, drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. And then he came up and he touched the briar and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And that dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. And then fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. Jesus is, what did we say? The resurrection and life. Literally, sometimes. Spiritually, always. Another, another example is from Luke. And it's a little longer. Do we have hope knowing Jesus' resurrection and life? Luke eight forty one through 56 says, And there came a man named Jairus who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. And as Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. So she came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? And when all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surrounding you are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, remember we said nothing is hidden? She came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. But while he was still speaking, you remember where it started with Jairus's daughter? While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter's dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear. Only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him, except Peter, John, and James, and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her, but he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. 
and they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Now, aren't those powerful examples of resurrection and the life? And I'm not going to read it, but you all know the story of Martha and Mary and Lazarus. But you know what? Jesus did not just bring other people back to life, did he? He himself was raised from the dead. Acts 3.15 says, And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. So do you remember our overall theme tonight is hope? So as we ponder, we wonder and consider, does this, what we're reading, does this scripture, does this truth of God give us hope? And I'm just going to read this passage and then we're going to move on to the next one. If Christ had not risen, he had no hope, but he did. And look what Paul said. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, with a capital S, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope, which is seen, is not hope, but who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And the best thing is, we have new birth in Jesus here and now. I'm skipping some because there's too many wonderful scriptures. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Is that a clear direction? And this is what happens in Revelation. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. Hope. We have hope. And not only that, another title of Jesus is King of Kings. Actually, it should read this way King of Kings. Matthew 2.2 2 says, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Think about it. King of kings and Lord of lords. At the very beginning of his life on earth, common normal people, shepherds, not rich people, 
and wise men, who probably were pagans, were among the first to recognize him. Not counting, of course, John from within the room. Remember when the baby leapt, wept in Elizabeth's room because of the spirit? And then, at the very end, when he, when he was crucified and rose again, normal people, fishermen, women even, who knew him for who he is, who he was, who he forever shall be. And even Pontius Pilate made that sign that said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, King of kings, and Lord of lords. Jesus came to earth in humility, born in a stable. He came into Jerusalem at the end in what they call the triumphal procession, riding a donkey. He rode a donkey when he was in the womb. Luke 19.38 says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace on earth. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And you know what? He shall return. Revelation 19.16 says, On his robe, Baruch Hashayab, yeah. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, really? <laughs> can you spell it? You probably can. So is there anything? Is there anything? And probably there is, if we're honest. Is there anything? Health, wealth, success, status that we want more than a relationship was real? Alive and vital with Jesus our Messiah. I have tons more verses about Jesus as King, but I'm going to skip them all, except I want to read Revelation 15 3. In fact, we're going to have to end soon anyway. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. I could, but I'm not. But I do want to do this one. And I'll, I'll put the other one with next week. It doesn't matter. And that's what we do. We pray. We confess. We admit our faults, our failures, and our sin. We admit our inability and our own strength to get it right. Because we can't get it right. There's no possible way. However... In Christ, all things are possible. And day by day, one choice at a time, moment by moment, year by year, we are transformed, we are renewed. We are in that process of sanctification. And the scripture says, He, the Lord Jesus, who began a good work in you, will complete it until the day, some versions say, of his return. Others say of Christ Jesus. Yes, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And if we didn't, Mario, you wouldn't even care. <laughs> That's that spirit convicting you and me and all the rest of us. So the other one I want to cover tonight is Light of the World. I like that song that goes, Light of the world, you shine down into darkness. Open our eyes, let us see. I don't remember the rest of the song. I want to quote from the book. Jesus illuminates our lives with his brilliance, shining into every nook and cranny. Even the revelation of hidden sin, see Mario, is a gift, like the fortunate early diagnosis of a deadly cancer. He reveals not only our sins, but also all that is beautiful surrounding us. He awakens our souls to see the history of redemption 
And you know, you have a history of redemption too. Think about before you knew Jesus. And think about a month after you knew Jesus. And a year and five years and however long you've been walking with him. You're not the same person. You don't act the same. You don't talk the same. We don't think the same. We've been redeemed and we are being redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Transformed, renewed, made whole. Moment by moment, day by day, and year by year. And he awakens our souls to see that history of redemption and the wonderful works of God all around us. As David says, in your light, we see life. And the scripture that they're referring to is from Psalms. 36, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. And I want to say something from my heart. Speaking to myself, not pointing my fingers at anybody, but what do we see? Do we focus on light or dark? Do we focus on sin or do we act in sin or purity? So we have light and dark. We have sin and purity. We have doom and gloom or we have joy and hope. They don't coexist in the same moment. I learned from actually a secular psychologist that you can only think, I, I, I can only think one thought at a time. And I can, with the help of the Holy Spirit, choose which thought I'm going to sit there and think on. And believe me, in the last six weeks, I've had a lot of practice. (laughs) I've had a lot of practice in the last 10 years. So, choice, one choice at a time, one moment at a time, one day at a time, one year at a time. So we have light or dark, sin or purity, doom and gloom, or joy and hope. What are we showing the world around us as we go through our daily struggles? And what do we want to show the world around us tomorrow when we get up and go through our daily struggle? What do we want to focus on? Are we looking for? Yes, and what will we fill the clay vessel Are we looking for and tuned into and sharing light or darkness? Which? And it seems to me, it seems to me that there's plenty of dark everywhere. But we are light bearers. Remember? Hiding your light under a bushel. That's that kid song, hide my light under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. You know that song, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. (laughs) Luke 11.33 says, No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. I know. I know that I could do a better job at it. And I also know that when I am busy looking for what I call little gifts, which God taught me to do, everywhere I go, I'm looking for little gifts. All the posters you see me do, those are because my eyes are looking for little gifts in the sky when I'm driving along. And I'll pull the car over and take a picture of them sometimes. So I I look and God sends to each one of us every single moment, even the hardest moments, I myself have learned to be much happier and can do and know joy in the midst of sorrow by looking for little gifts. So Christmas, Christmas is all, a oh, lady said something. I am thankful for this one, but God chose the foolish things of the world for shame the wise, and he chose the weak of the world to shame the strong. Absolutely. When we are weak, then we are strong. Christmas is all around us this month. Lights are everywhere. Decorations are mostly secular, but could we choose to look at them and rejoice that Jesus is the light of the world? He has come and he is returning. I'm checking my notes just a second.
I'm going to read one, one scripture and then pose a question, and then we're going to close. I think we've had enough. Oh, I'll tell you another story, real quick personal story, but let's do this first. First John 5, uh, first John 1, 5 through 7 says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. But if we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from all sin. So doesn't it seem like we are being exhorted to live as children of the light, to honor God in all we do, and in so doing, draw others who desire to know more about this one who is the light of the world. So I hope you enjoyed our little pondering tonight. Um, I want to tell you a little story about how I put this into practice. Some of you know, I've told you in DM, that these people that live next door to me, they bought this 10-foot tall skeleton. It's hideous. It's hideous. It's the ugliest thing I ever saw in my whole life. And they put it up in October. And I was thinking, well, at least it's going to be gone. And it's right beside me. And when I sit in my tree, I can see that thing, or I could. So then the other day I saw them getting the Santa Claus, an eight-foot Santa Claus out of a box. And I thought, oh, good, maybe they're going to put that skeleton away. But you know what? They did not put that skeleton away. They put Thanksgiving clothes on it, and now it has a Christmas scarf. And it irritated me to death. I mean, I was thinking, I wasn't thinking about light at all. But then the other day I had a revelation from God. I can look at that thing. And every time I see that thing and feel the irritation that I have to have that thing in the yard next to me, and I have no control over it, which I don't, I can remember that Jesus, Jesus defeated death and hell, and he's a conquering king in victory. And that thing over there has no, it's a symbol to me now of Jesus defeated death and hell. So now, when I look at it, I don't have to get so irritated. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I'm so happy. Thank you, Jesus, <laughs> for showing me that way to think of that thing and practicing what I say. You know, taking the thoughts captive. I was having a little bit of a hard time with that thing. So, Father, we bless you. Yes, it is. It, and I put a little nativity flag in my yard. Father, we, but not because I just loved it. Uh, Father, we bless you in this day. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you that you came into this dark world as the light of the world, the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. But you are the light. And Lord, I thank you that you have helped given us the light of the Holy Spirit to indwell us so that wherever we go, whatever we do, whoever we see, that we can be your light in the darkness that is all around us. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that we are your sons and daughters. And Lord, I ask you that if anybody in here is lonely or n not doing well with the holiday season, Father, that you would shine your light, that you would draw us into your radiance and that we would be able to rest all that concerns us. Give it to you, Lord. Lay it at the foot of the cross. Leave it there and embrace who you are and that there is hope because you are our hope, living hope. Father, thank you for this time together and bless each precious heart here in Jesus' name. Amen. And the violinist is going to play, so don't run away. Thank you for coming and letting me share. I had pages and pages today. <laughs>
I think so. The violinist. Are you going to play your violin for us? Your mic's off. He always does. He always does. Yes, I'm getting my hymnals ready. Falls behind. You should have had them out this afternoon. Leave it to him. Leave it to him. Leave it to him. Sorry, Shalom. I'm sorry. This is what he does. This is what he does. It's normal for him. There's a play this PlayStation. This is what I get. This is what I get. I can't walk. I don't have anything to eat. This is what I get. It's not that I'm upset with you, God, because I'm not. I don't have any right to deserve this. But I'm not Come back again. Be sure and come in here because we speak half of what we say. Okay. And welcome. I'm so glad you came among us. Violin is going to play. <laughs> Thank you, the violinists. Thank you all for coming. And tomorrow, Coram Deo has a message for us. I don't know what it is. He could tell you if he's still here. But whatever it is, it will be good. And we'll see you next week and tomorrow and Friday with the violinists. Night. <laughs>